The session, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Nicholas Place, uh, who is currently an assistant professor in the Institute of Sports Sciences and the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Switzerland. Uh, and he'll be uh, talking, talking to us today about skeletal muscle adaptations to sprint interval training, the role of calcium. And we have a uh, slightly different audience who are interested in this topic as well. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers because it's a very nice meeting and the uh, first time for me to attend. Definitely, definitely not the last time, so I really enjoy the conference. Um, so today I'm going to talk about sprint interval training, which is quite trendy. So we could see a lot of posters, quite a few presentations on this topic. So let's try to uh, put some calcium within it. So it's not uh, really a a secret has been well established that aerobic capacity of VO2 max predicts all-cause mortality. There have been several papers published in the last 20, 30 years. And uh, to improve VO2 max, you have different possibilities. The first one is to use MICT, moderate intensity continuous training, for 30 minutes plus, until a few hours if you want, at a relatively low intensity. The second one is to use high intensity interval training or HIT, which consists of uh, relatively intense amount of exercise, but still uh, below the velocity or power associated to VO2 max. And the last one could be sprint interval training or SIT, which consists of supramaximal or all out uh, in some, some circumstances uh, efforts performed at an intensity above VO2 max. And uh, so I think quite close from here, actually, uh, some years ago, 15 years ago, the lab of Martin Gibala showed that if healthy young participants are uh, exposed to either sit or mix for a few weeks, they will improve their VO2 max. And they can improve that in, oh, sorry, quite some, uh, uh, in a similar manner more or less, despite the fact that in, that, uh, in these models that we detailed uh, after, the weekly training volume was 10 times lower uh, during SITs as compared to MICT. So it can then be interesting to uh, implement SITs in uh, various uh, populations, uh, including, uh, I mean, including healthy and clinical populations, as lack of time is number one by your two regular exercise participation. The mechanisms, uh, cellular and or molecular mechanisms that uh, could drive the different responses to this kind of training are certainly different. They are not well understood. In this presentation, I will focus on the skeletal muscle and uh, on the role of uh, calcium on mitochondrial adaptations. So the exercise paradigms we uh, use are quite uh, similar to what was proposed uh, by uh, the team of Martin Gibler some years ago. So six times 30 seconds all out sprints. So whether or not it's physiological is a, a debate. I think it's physiological, definitely hard. I've done that a few times. They are still here, but uh, some memories. Um, MICT was uh, induced by uh, one hour at 65% of the maximal aerobic power. And the experimental protocol that uh, we use for the different studies I will present is also uh, quite simple. It's just a knee extensor neuromuscular function assessment, so some voluntary contractions and some uh, electrical stimulation, muscle biopsy, then exercise, uh, either sit or mix, and again, uh, evaluations right after exercise, and also 24 hours after exercise. Uh, this I can skip, because I think you've heard quite a lot uh, this morning, but just uh, here I will uh, mainly focus on the role of the random receptor or a uh, real one protein. In humans, to assess um, peripheral function, we can use single stimulation, and if we are interested in quadriceps, we can stimulate the femoral nerve. This stimulation, if performed on the resting muscle, uh, will give you an M wave, if you recall electromyographic activity, which is a reflect of neuromuscular excitability. And if you record force, you will have a muscle twitch. 
And if you record both, you will have uh, quite a good idea of what can be the uh, excitation contraction coupling in humans. So now, if uh, we look at seats, this, uh, this type of exercise, so six times, 30 seconds, uh, so six wing gate tests, then of course you will have a decrease in, in the mean power. As you can see here, you will have a decrease in the maximal power through the course of the exercise. And if now we compare seat, so in yellow and mix in gray, you can see that the force, maximal voluntary contraction force reduction is about the same after both kind of exercise. And it's quite uh, interesting, I think, to see that only three minutes of exercise can induce uh, force depression of 30 to 40 percent. Looking at M wave, so neuromuscular excitability, not much changes after either exercise. But if you look at evoked force, in that case, per stimulation, evoked at 10 hertz or 100 hertz, there is clearly uh, a reduction in force and it, during both exercises, actually, or after both exercises. And if you do the ratio over 10 over 100 hertz as an index of low frequency fatigue or prolonged low frequency force depression, there is also a, a depression which is higher after the seat exercise. And what's interesting is that this uh, prolonged low frequency force depression has been associated to a reduction in calcium release, as was shown in the early work of uh, Okan some years ago. And there was uh, a clear reduction in force which was associated with a reduction in a calcium release. And this effect is much higher, of course, at low calcium uh, co concentration as compared to higher calcium concentration due to the sigmoidal shape of the force calcium relationship. So the first message that CT induces large peripheral fatigue levels, and this is probably due to impaired sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium release. So now, and uh, Robin mentioned that, uh, we did a study some, uh, some years ago, and uh, we found that one session of SIT was enough to induce this degradation of the HER1 protein. And it was actually apparent 24 hours after exercise. We also combined in that paper uh, experiments with intact signal fibers, exactly the same model that Arthur just presented before uh, in, this, in his presentation. And we could show that there was a reduction in, um, in the uh, amount of calcium released through the six repetition of, let's say, mimicking exercise, six times 30 seconds, trying to mimic what, what we did in humans. And uh, that this reduction in calcium was also persistent over time. It persisted for at least two hours after the end of exercise. And uh, in addition of that, an increase in resting calcium was measured in these syntactical fibers, suggesting that uh, calcium was accumulating within the cytosol after this repeated uh, sprint. This was prevented by the, uh, the um, presence of NAC, so antioxidants, so this degradation of the renal principle was prevented with NAC, which suggests a role of oxidative stress in the process. And we did some uh, other studies. Yeah, there's lots of graphs here. And just the take home message here is that uh, this real one degradation seems to be individual dependent. It's not all of them, all of us, that will show that. And uh, training seems to be one of the protective effects, let's say. And uh, yeah, this uh, very recent study that Robin also mentioned yeah, show that there are some variability, but that's a the, uh, the protein can be degraded even after only six hours of exercise. Okay, so this protein, so here one, can be altered after seeds, and there are inter individual differences. So this um, first result seems to suggest that calcium can be leaking through the renal receptor. And in normal condition, calcium will, will be in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, I mean in the absence of action potential, and will stay there mostly because the urine receptor is in a closed state as it's stabilized by another protein, a small protein called FKBP12, 
or calstabin-1 in the skeletal muscle. But under stressful conditions, such as some pathologies, for instance, what could happen is that the renin receptor can be oxidized, phosphorylated, nitrosylated, or acetylated, which will lead to calstabin dissociation from the main receptor, and then will uh, make it leaky, which could explain, in some circumstances, uh, muscle weakness. And this was uh, actually shown uh, several times in uh, Andy Mark's laboratory at Columbia University, New York, when they actually uh, quantify muscle weakness on the left with a mouse model of cancer. And they could show that there is a reduction in specific force in this model as compared to wild type mice. That was associated with oxidation, neutralization of the renin receptor, leading to calstabin dissociation, as shown here on this co-immunoprecipitation. Uh, this was about the same story for a dystrophic muscle, so MDX mice here. You can see nitrosylation of the receptor over time, which led to calstabin dissociation. So this is a leaky signature of the renin protein. What's interesting is that exercise can also lead to these leaky signatures. So here was a, a study that again performed in the Marx laboratory, and they could show that three consecutive days at 70% VO2 max for three hours on a bike, they could show that the, uh, the real one was degraded, at least nitrosylated, uh, phosphorylated, and leading to castamine dissociation. And more recently, and this is a work from uh, Hawkins Laboratory, where they show that mm, training mice, or at least allowing mice to uh, to access to a, a wheel uh, to run, of course, uh, will increase their uh, aerobic capacity, and this might be mediated by the, re the uh, dissociation here of the castab insulin receptor, so this leaky signature, again, a rise in basal calcium, and this was associated when taking single fibers from these mice to an increased fatigue resistance, as you can see the comparison here before and after training. So there is some kind of discrepancy in the literature that on the potential role of the calcium leak, if it's beneficial, is it detrimental? Most studies will say it's detrimental, but there are some evidence here that can, can actually work. And what we intended to do in a, a study that is recently published, and this, most of the work has been done by Nadej Zanu here, is to compare SIT and MIX and trying to address the question whether is the superiority of seeds, more than superiority is the faster effect of seed, could this be mediated partly by uh, this leakage channel that we observe? And uh, we compare the so seeds and MICT, and uh, as you can see here, only after the seed training was this channel, this, uh, yeah, the calcium channel and receptor, phosphorylated, oxidized, nitrosylated, and this caused calcium dissociation as quantified here. After MICT, no such pattern was uh, found. Again, here it's only one session of exercise. Um, to get some more insight into this leak of calcium, I contacted Brad uh, Loniconis in Brisbane. I went there for a few months and uh, performed a study using their model. So to make it short, uh, this model consists of painting a fiber, or at least a piece of fiber from a muscle biopsy, and uh, painting the fiber with a calcium dye, which will then uh, remain on the sarcolemma, go to the tissue and then a mechanical removal of the sarcolemma, so skin fiber, will trap the dye within the tissue So this is what we can see here. So you paint the fiber, you remove sarcolemma, and then you have the dye, so calcium dye, which is trapped with the tubule, and this can be used as, in a, as a reflect of the leak of calcium. Why? Because, uh, again, quite a bit busy here, but uh, I'll try to explain. Uh, so you have your receptor here, sarcoplasmic reticulum, junctional space, and the t tubule here. If your receptor is leaky, calcium will accumulate here, and the high concentration will be will be reached, which will cause uh, calcium to be extruded by the PMCA into, in that case, into the T-tubule, 
which will make, uh, for instance, signal to be uh, quite high. Now you can also play with the renal receptor and prevent it from leaking by inhib inhibiting it with tetracaine. And if you inhibit this uh, renal receptor, less calcium will be here and less calcium will be extruded to the T tubule. And the difference in fluorescence in between these two states is indicative of the leak of calcium. So that's what we, we did. And uh, again, it's preliminary data, because there are still the data to be collected. But uh, at a given uh, cytosolic acid concentration, in that case 67 nanomolars, which is close to the resting condition, uh, what we could observe before exercise was a difference with, without tetracaine and with tetracaine of that magnitude here, which was much lower as compared to after exercise, 24 hours after exercise here. So these data that are quantified here suggest that the leak of calcium, so again, the difference you have between here and here before exercise, is lower than the difference between here and here after exercise. So yes, there, this is the evidence that there is some leak occurring after uh, one session of sprint interval training. And what was interesting also is that when we quantified the uh, Oxford protein content, there was an increase just after one session, actually, uh, in complex one and complex two, only after seats. One session of MICT was not enough to induce this adaptation. Of course, it's possible to get this adaptation over time, but not after one session, if the MICT uh, paradigm is used. So SIT induces calcium leak through renal receptor and will increase Oxfos protein content. So now the idea was to link both. And for that, we developed uh, a model based on C2C12 myotubes, which were electrically stimulated, uh, trying to mimic again uh, one mixed session and one seed session. So we call that S mixed and S seed for simulated mixed simulated seed. So you have the details here. So we'll try to be close to what could be in humans. And the good thing with that model is that we can use a drug called S107, which is a real one stabilizer, which will prevent calcibin to be dissociated from the main channel. So we'll, what the, the effect is that it will stop calcium uh, to leak from the channel. Uh, what we observed is that uh, in our model uh, we get, get quite close results so what, uh, to what we get in humans, which is after one uh, st stimulation session, we have this post modification of the channel, which leads to calcium associations, as you can see here. And when we put S107 um, for, uh, for three hours and then we quantified the changes, there still was this post transfer modification, but calstabin was not dissociated. So we prevented, presumably, this leak of calcium. And uh, as, a, as an evidence, when we quantified the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium store by putting caffeine to deplete the stores, uh, we were able to show that the stores were actually lower after the simulated seat exercise as compared to the mixed or control condition. And using a, another approach to directly target, so a threat-based imaging, directly like a sacroplasmic reticulum uh, content, uh, the same results were uh, shown. So the question now is, does this calcium go into the mitochondria? Is there a link between uh, what we observed at the real level and the increase in uh, Oxfos content? Uh, the answer is, uh, it's, it seems to be because, uh, again, when we did the same study or the same uh, exercise, and with or without this uh, S107 drug, you can see that the induction of complex one, complex two, and et cetera, was prevented with this uh, S107 drug here. So it seems to suggest that the leak of calcium is at least partly involved in the process. Um, here it's another piece of evidence showing that so this is a metro trucker red, so to track the, um, let's say the contents of the mitochondria. And again, we show that uh, S107 blunted the increase in uh, fluorescence. It was the same story with mitochondrial function here, uh, NADH-linked respiration, so increase after one session of simulated exercise, 
and blunted with the drug, preventing the leak. So preventing this leak blunts mitochondrial adaptation after a seat. And the last step will be to uh, actually show that calcium is entering the mitochondria. So to enter the mitochondria, calcium has to go through the, uh, mostly through the VDAC channel on the outer membrane, and also to cross the inner membrane through the MCU complex. If calcium goes into the mitochondria, it can activate several enzymes. One of them is uh, PDH, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which will convert or decarboxylate pyruvate to then uh, produce acetyl-CoA, which will then enter the TCA cycle. And so what we did try to quantify mitochondrial calcium, again, mixed seed and seed plus this S107. And what we were able to show is that yeah, the uptake of calcium when we put this S107 drug was lower, and especially was lower uh, after the stimulation, so once the uh, action potentials have stopped. And it was exactly the same pattern when using the um, mitoxantron, which is an MCU inhibitor. So we could show that the uptake of calcium is actually lower if we prevent the leak and if we prevent the MCU to, uh, to work correctly. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, so calcium, mitochondrial calcium will activate uh, PDH, and uh, actually we show that uh, one session of uh, simulated seeds in the cells could reduce the phosphorylation of PDH, which means that it activates PDH, because PDH activation is based on the dephosphorylation. And uh, this dephosphorylation was again prevented by S107 or the MCU inhibitor. And this seems to also be relevant for humans because one session of seeds in humans, also we could show that there is a reduction here in the phosphorylation of the PDH, which was not the case after only one session of mix. So we have this, um, this model that uh, suggests that the leak of calcium through a modified organ receptor would enter the mitochondria to dephosphorylate uh, PDH and induce some uh, mitochondrial remodeling. Uh, this is just what I said. So the acute uh, calcium leak in the muscle, I think, can be considered beneficial, as we show clear and uh, and show clear differences with the sustained calcium leak that, we, that I presented before. Uh, this dystrophic muscle cancer, etc. So if it's acute, we think it's quite beneficial. We hope that we've shown that uh, quite clearly. And uh, the perspective of this work, I think, would be interesting to try to combine exercise with uh, some MCU activator to maybe potentiate uh, its effect. Uh, investigate the adaptation, of course, to chronic intervention. What we show was the proof of concept after one session, what's happening after a real uh, training of several weeks. That uh, needs to be done, and also in the clinical populations, which could benefit, actually, from uh, this kind of intervention. And also to better understand the role of oxygen limitation in the adaptations to seeds. I'm saying that because uh, one of uh, PhD students working in uh, our lab is interested in uh, hypoxia. And what he, he showed, actually, is that uh, so green is seeds in normoxia, uh, blue is there is seed in hypoxia, and it could show that the uh, beneficial effect of one session again of exercise, uh, here you can see complex one, complex two, for instance, complex three, that has an increase, as I mentioned before, in the protein expression, that was blunted in hypoxic condition, which is quite uh, interesting, uh, just thinking on a on the training perspective. And this, uh, we are still figuring out what's happening, but one possibility is that the calcium uptake by the mitochondria, so here you have isolated mitochondria from uh, heart muscle, mouse, mouse heart muscle, and we can see that the calcium uptake is much lower when oxygen is limiting rather than uh, 
when oxygen is not a limiting factor. So this, uh, these are uh, taken in the uh, Ouroboros instrument. So with this, I'd like to thank the people in uh, Lausanne, especially Nadej, who's done most of the, of the work here. Uh, of course, collaborations with Okan, Brad, uh, Eric Snyder for Ouroboros. Um, Andy Marks uh, for all the rendered interceptor, uh, people at Nestle also for some measurements we have done, uh, Johanna works at the OPFL for some uh, analysis we have performed together, and you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Nicholas. One Open question. First. Thanks for a great talk. I was wondering, and I'm not sure if I got it right, but on one slide you showed that NAC um, prevents the accumulation of calcium and cytosol. So do you think it's an MCU activator? Uh, we show that NAC, we show that uh, NAC prevents the real one degradation in the mouse model. Uh, we haven't measured the, uh, yeah, the calcium concentration in the cytosol. Uh, I, I'm not sure, because uh, what I think is happening is that NAC could prevent this uh, post transfer modification. So I think it's more on that level rather than the MCU. It's, it's upstream, I think, as compared to the MCU effect, if any. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, I have a, a question. Um, in, in resting muscle, do, you, do we have an idea of what the the rate of RYR calcium leak is, and, I, and I'm wondering why, uh, presumably it's leaking out, and, uh, but it's not, real, it's not changing the resting calcium concentration, which is constant in muscle because it's being taken up by the calcium pump and, and contributing to the basal mm -hmm. metabolic rate of the muscle. And I'm wondering why, after exercise, you know, increasing leak doesn't just get taken back up into the SR, why we're seeing yeah, I don't know. It's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, if it would be taken by the uh, by the SR, then it won't go to the mitochondria. We won't be able to see this uh, beneficial adaptation we are. So it's clearly a sign of, yeah, it's clearly one of the explanation of why this can be beneficial. It's not the the only one, but I think we're still on the premise of understanding what this calcium leak actually is, because lots of studies suggest that it's, when it's chronic at least, it's, yeah, it's clearly detrimental. And uh, here it's uh, one of the first suggestions showing that it can be beneficial, but we clearly need some, yeah, probably some more years to, to answer this question, sorry. <laughs> okay, any other questions for Nicholas? One more question, okay. Curious if the uh, amount of the leaking of the calcium is enough for um, you know, inducing uh, MCU uptake, because we know the KD of that is 10 to 15 micromolar. And um, you have, and the delta between exercise versus uh, non other exercise is sort of like small. I don't know if you've ever measured ab absolute you know, concentration. Of yeah, no, we haven't, as you that's what we, We'll, yeah, hopefully, we'll, what we'll do is, uh, with Brad. But you're right, so it has to be a uh, micromolar concentration to activate MCU, but some reports suggest that it can also be nanomolar concentrations. There are these nanodomains very close to the mitochondria because the uh, SR is in contact within the mitochondria. So actually, the leak doesn't need to be very high for calcium to enter the mitochondria. And also, a follow-up question. Have you ever seen if there are any depolarization of mitochondria? And which might trigger some sort of like a downstream mitophagy or whatever, which sort of like consistent with the first session? No weapons measured, but uh, with uh, what Chris is doing in combining apoxia, uh, then he, yeah, he is measuring uh, membrane potential. And uh, with this different rate of calcium uptake, it's affecting uh, mitochondrial uh, membrane potential, which might be then a trigger explaining the. The, the absence of uh, beneficial adaptations we could see after one session in hypoxia. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Uh, I think we'll we'll end there. And uh, okay. <laughs> just want to 
say thank you again to, uh, to the organizers uh, for a great meeting and the sponsors and of course to uh, the speakers for their excellent presentations and thank you uh, to the audience for uh, attending and your great questions. Thank you. <laughs>